loved dearly. It was quite clear through his letter just how much he loved them. And he charges them at the end of this letter to consider a sincere Christian walk and what that actually looks like. And the challenges that may be facing them because they take a stand. And, and so you can't help but think of Paul's own life as an example. And other people through church history. You can't help but think of people like Corey Ten Boom, who many of you know and have read her history and her life. And how her family was real sympathetic to the Jews that were hiding out from the Nazis, and not just them, but also the, the mentally disabled that as part of the eugenics program of the Nazis were trying to create a superior race and looking at the Jews and also the mentally disabled as hindrances to that and in fact trying to annihilate them, wipe them off of the face of the earth. And then there were bold people like Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy and her family, who were so committed to taking a stance against this juggernaut of a government bent on world domination. And eventually she ended up in a concentration camp, not one, but a couple. And uh, she would smuggle Bibles in and at the, the risk of her own life. And it was, in fact, a clerical error that caused her to be released from this concentration camp where... Weeks later, over 30 women were put into the gas chambers and lost their lives. And she had heard from the Lord to continue to witness to and be a blessing to and a, a home to those less fortunate, those that are recovering from the terrible effects of war. And so she continued to open her home up to not only those less fortunate, but the, the mentally handicapped and uh, Jews as well, and in fact, it was during the season known as the Hunger Winter, particularly in the Netherlands that was Germany, uh, German occupied, that she began that ministry, having faced all of these things. And she said this in regards to Christ, you can never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. That's a real faith. Paul is explaining to them that Christ is all you need. And you may very well find, like myself, Paul is saying, that in that moment when everyone else and everything else has failed you, Christ is all you need. You know, it wasn't just Paul. It wasn't just Corey Ten Boom and her family. There were other people who we can look at through history with a real faith I like to look at this as apologetically. You know, people who finished well. I have a friend who won't read a Christian author's book until he has passed on to heaven because he wants to make sure that he finishes well. That's an interesting take. I think you probably maybe miss out on some wise teaching, but uh, he only reads those brothers and sisters who have gone on to heaven. Um, people like Justin Martyr who was really foundational in the early church, the wisdom and his education and what it meant to be a bishop and the formation of the church, taking those principles from the New Testament, from, from the whole scripture and, and really just being an integral part of ministry and the surrounding areas and ultimately losing his life during the rule and reign of Antonius. It was his boldness that we look at today, a boldness to, to stand up to evil. He made a comment, a comment, he made quite the comment. He was standing in front of the execution chamber when he said, when you hear that we look for a kingdom, he's saying this because he was challenging the Roman authorities to stop Christian persecution. He said this, when you hear that we look for a kingdom, you suppose without making any inquiry that, that we speak of a human kingdom. 
Instead, we speak of that which is God, as can be shown from the confession of their faith made by those who are charged with being Christians, even though they know that death is the punishment awarded to those who so confess. For if we looked for a human kingdom, we would deny our Christ so that we might not be killed. We would try to escape detection so that we might obtain what we hope for. But since our thoughts are not fixed on the present, we are not concerned when men cut us off. Think about that. Since death is a debt which must at all events be paid. He said that to a Roman authority that was trying to actively spend their energy on getting rid of Christians. It's a real faith. Beheaded. And we know that he was beheaded because the evidence is there for, through history. His trial is recorded. The penalty is recorded. He went on and he finished well. But his faith was real. You know, Leonard Ravenhill, the English author, he said this, the English evangelist, really. He said this, the early church was married to poverty, prisons and persecutions. Today the church is married to prosperity, personality, popularity. If it's a popularity contest, and we're married to personality versus the Scriptures and what it truly means to be a believer in Jesus Christ, then we're missing the mark. Finally, I want to share with you before we get into this last part of the letter, Ignatius of Antioch, who died in and around 150, 160 A.D., he was martyred. In fact, it wasn't just beheading. It wasn't a sword. It was him being made a spectacle in the Roman Colosseum. One of the most heinous, wicked things that had happened to Christians in this early church persecution. He was instrumental in writing a series of letters with Polycarp, with Clement of Rome. And those letters compiled were firm foundations for an early church that was facing the real possibility that their faith would be challenged and that they would have the strength to go on to death should it be required of them for the sake of the furtherance of the gospel. He said this, in the letters to the Romans, may I enjoy the wild beasts. He knew what his fate was going to be. May I enjoy the wild beasts that are prepared for me. I pray that they would be found eager to rush at me. And I will also entice them to devour me speedily and not deal with me as some whom out of fear they have not touched. If they are unwilling to assail me, I will compel them to do so. He says, pardon me, for I know my benefit. Now I begin to be a disciple. Let no one of the things visible or invisible prevent me from attaining to Jesus Christ. Let fire and the cross, let wild beasts, let tearings, let breakings, let dislocation of bones, let cutting off of limbs, let shatterings of the whole body, let all evil torments of the devil come upon me, only let me attain Jesus Christ. That's powerful. So when Paul writes this letter, the people that I shared with you, Justin Martyr, Ignatius of Antioch, and many other brothers and sisters, finished well knowing that, one, their life may be required, and counted the cost to say, he is worthy. Paul is convincing them here in Philippians 4, he is worthy. Count the cost. And he begins by saying, I implore, implore, Euodia, and I implore, Syntyche, 
to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. You know what these two ladies' names mean? Iodia, prosperous journey. Sintiki means pleasant acquaintance. They weren't living up to their name, were they? They had been such a great part of Paul's ministry. He loved them dearly, but there was some type of dissension in the ranks. There was something happening that needed to be dealt with. And Paul says, whatever the details are, it's not important. It doesn't even need to be covered in Scripture. The most important thing is, is that you have to remember, believer, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Your your name is written in the book of life. So look beyond. Look beyond this. Rejoice. Rejoice at your trial. You remember the previous chapter. Rejoice in the Lord, he said. And the chapter before that. And the chapter before that. At least two times in each chapter in Philippians, he says, rejoice in the Lord. You remember last week we talked about what that means. It means to be well off. And the world thinks well off means something completely different. But here, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Has your trial made you happy? Paul's not saying, I need you to be happy. He's saying, I need you to be rejoicing. I need you to be joyful. Your trial may make you unhappy. And he's not saying, put on a happy face. Put on the outward. Make sure that you don't cause any kind of trouble and just make sure that everything is, seems to be perfectly good on the, on the surface. Hold it together. He's not saying that. He's saying no matter what the circumstances are, no matter the trial you're facing, no matter the trouble you may have with somebody, rejoice in the Lord. Consider that your name is in the book of life and look beyond it. Rejoice. Paul himself showed inner joy, in spite of the outward failings, his own body betraying him, his life marred by difficulties and imprisonments and beatings. But he says, I want to encourage you, be, be well off. Be well off. And the only way that you're well off is to rejoice in the Lord. Paul's saying in the last part of this letter, for the Christian to live Right? To live, right? So to live, Christ must be at the center. And this is really what he's saying. He's reminding them that Christ has to be at the center. No matter the whirlwind that's going on in your personal life or in the nation you live in, no matter what is taking place, Christ must be the center. It's the only way. And he says, having Christ as the center, then just stand fast in him. Rejoice in him. And from verse 5 to verse 7, he speaks of what it means to live in the light of that presence. And it says here in verse 5, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. You have to know this. The way that that is worded, it's not necessarily meaning that the Lord is near, so live gently because he can see your actions. The Lord is at hand points to the end of all things. And because no matter how many years go on, the fact is is that this life in the light of eternity is quite small. He's reminding them, Christ is the center, stand fast, shine your light in spite of what's going on because with the time you have here, it is of the utmost importance. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So there's a lot contained within those few verses. When it speaks of gentleness, the, the Greek word is apikais, which gentleness in this sense, means that not only to live with one another, uh, bearing with one another, but have a non-retaliatory spirit. That really qualifies the gentleness that Paul is talking about. Have a non-retaliatory spirit. So whether he's just speaking to these two individuals at the beginning of the chapter, 
it ultimately speaks to all of us. If there is even one in a dispute of two that has a non-retaliatory spirit, things are going to be okay. God will deal with both of them. But our command, our success, our sincere walk, magnifying God and his character, is to have a non-retaliatory spirit, gentleness. And let that gentleness be known to all men. That doesn't, in, that doesn't just mean you know, our friends, the people we like to be around, those people that grate against us, those people that you know, have completely opposite personalities, those that you may even begin to question in your mind. Are they really for me? They seem like they're tripping me up left and right. It seems like they're passive, aggressive towards me. No, no, no. All men, non-retaliatory, gentle spirit, and let it be known. Because ultimately it is the character of God. So, rejoice in the Lord. Let that inner quality of joy show forth outwardly in that godly gentleness. Because joy really is an unseen thing. The inner change, the inner peace, really only shows itself forth in the fruit of gentleness. So when Paul says, because you have that joy, people may not know that other than your character. Let that gentle spirit, your non-retaliatory way, be how you are known. Why? Because people want to think you're a good guy or a good girl? Ultimately, it's because we represent something far bigger than ourselves. We are ambassadors to Christ. There is so much at stake. <clears throat> Why is it important? The Lord is near. Right? Again, we're talking rapture here, not relation to. In our men's prayer breakfast yesterday, uh, we began talking a little bit about end times. And it's good to talk about what, how, if, if the Christians are going to be, ta- if the bride the church is going to be taken out in one massive, quick moment. How is the rest of the world going to justify that? How are they going to look at that and say, you know, I, I'm not going to surrender to God. Or I'm going to justify that this happened because of something else, right? Couldn't, couldn't be God coming for his church, just like the Bible says. And we kind of talked that over a little bit. And it, you know, even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, for the church to, to even bring up the idea of, you know, what the government is now saying are UFOs, right? Now, I'm not saying there are UFOs, but what I'm saying is that the nation, the world is poised to accept and believe the lie that somebody or a group of people that would leave in the blink of an eye would somehow be gone for some justifiable reason. So you can see through history, you look at it and say, how how is that going to happen? And people not look at that and say, wow, God's word was true. Well, (laughs) you can see it now. Some mass exodus, how'd they go? Did the UFOs take them? Was it aliens, right? My brother Mike brought up a really good point, and he talked of even what happened at the, this past year with, those that stormed you know, down in Washington and, and were put in jail for their, their uh, insurrection. And they basically were not given a free trial. They were just put away, almost to be forgotten. And you know the persecution of the church in the last days is going to be very real. And I don't think that the United States is going to be exempt from that. So I share people like Corey and Justin, and I, and I think of those that finished well and were facing great persecution like Paul and, and how they counted the cost and considered Jesus Christ worthy of their whole lives. And so does that mean that we're, you know, for the most part going to be put away? I don't, I don't know. But this is what I do know. That because the Lord's return is near and you receive joy from the Lord, and you receive gentleness from the Lord, 
And there is an all-out attack on that very attribute that it has to be that God is preparing us for something. That we are to look different, to be different, to, to be so completely opposite from the rest of the world in spite of persecution. Let your gentleness be known. The joy, the joy that you're so desperately longing for, the joy that you have in the Lord, it'll be tested, but it's going to be found sincere because the Lord is not going to walk away on you. And when Corey says, you never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have, may, maybe that will be our lot. Who knows? But right now, we have to know where this is coming from. If you believe that you know, the all-out war on the sanctity of life, the abortion cause, is a social movement, then you are sorely mistaken that that is the root of it. That somehow this actually is about women's rights. You have completely missed all of this. This is not a social move. If you think that what's happening right now with the attack on you know, the, the human DNA and that God actually got it wrong and that there are in fact all of these different genders, and you think that that's a political movement or a social movement, you completely missed it. This is absolutely a spiritual movement, and it is the same attack that the enemy has attacked Christians, attacked humans with from all of history. Did God really say back in the garden? So what is happening right now is not something that we look at and say, this is a social thing, this is a political move, we have to look beyond it and realize who is at the foundation of it and why. Satan himself wants to completely annihilate, discredit, to move people to the place where they are unable to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to completely destroy what God has established as right and as good. And even something like our joy, he's constantly trying to rob from us and as he attacks through social movements, as he attacks the foundation of the church, I'm afraid that the church is at the point right now in history where it's just beginning to wake up to the, the wiles of the enemy. It is just really, truly beginning to wake up and say, no, no, no. It's not actually compassionate to go against what Jesus Christ has established as man and woman. It's not compassionate to say that the Scripture then doesn't apply for the Scripture now, that somehow we have grown beyond that, that just because our culture has changed, that somehow this book doesn't apply. It's not compassionate to water down God's Word and when He says is right and wrong, what He says is sin and what will separate us. In fact, we are to take what he says and to distribute that in love, fearing that there will be a great many that are lost because the world has some twisted version of what they believe is compassionate. And that is rooted in listening to the author of confusion, the devil himself. If we listen to that, we're not compassionate. We're tripping people up. We're stumbling their walk. We're making a pathway straight to hell for them when we're called to be the ones that take a stand in love. Not to destroy people's lives, but to bring them to the Savior. This isn't social. This isn't political. These are just the avenues. These are the vehicles that are being used by Satan himself to attack God. And it's been the same since the beginning of time. How can we attack God? We will attack His beloved. 
We will attack those that are made in his image. We will attack those that he died for. And this is what's happening right now. Church, we got to continue to stand firm in the truth. We have to know that our faith, being sincere, may mean that we have to stand up to difficult times. And we have to stand in front of difficult people with opposition to the beliefs that are held firm in the scriptures because ultimately eternity is at stake. It's not hate. The world says it's hate. It's not hate. The world says it because the author of confusion, the devil, says, here, throw this at them. You'll get 20, 30, maybe even 40% of the church that will say, I don't want to be hated. I want to love everybody. Okay, then I'll compromise. In the moment that you compromise and you don't understand the scriptures and what God says is, is required, that God doesn't get it wrong, that God from the beginning of time has made a way for humanity to be reconciled back to him. If we take any of that and water it down or allow the confusion of the enemy to creep in to our lives and to the church, man, we do a great injustice. God has us here at this time in history, and I know it seems overwhelmingly difficult that we have to stand firm, but there have been people, brothers and sisters, that have gone on before us, that have stood firm, counting the cost, recognizing Jesus Christ is worthy. And he is. So, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any worthy, meditate, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So who are we when we're alone? And that's a question I like to ask. A question I have to examine my own self with. I, I mean, not alone physically, but what, what are our thoughts like? Because we can be in a crowd, but our thoughts are just our thoughts. Paul recognizes that. God knows us, and by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, imparts this to Paul. Okay, so who are you? What are your thoughts like? How do we take those captive? How do we succeed in what we are called to? Well, Paul says there are six things. That which is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. What does it mean biblically to be true? Reliable. A firm foundation. Right things. Noble means dignified. Meditate upon things that have a firm foundation. The Word. Everything else is changing. Everything else is subject to change. Not here. Meditate upon the things that are true, that are noble, that are right, dignified, that are respectable. Meditate upon the things that are right. And by right, it means conform to God's standard. Meditate upon things that are pure. The Greek word is hagna, which means not to be mixed with any type of moral impurity, not even an ounce of it. That means not trying to justify actions and saying, well, it's either not that bad or is it really sin. Stay away from the edge. Stay away from the gray area. If you're unsure of whether you should or shouldn't do something, then maybe the Lord's convicting you. Well, it doesn't say here in the Scripture one way or another, but if you're wrestling with it, then stay away from it. Pure. Wrestle, or excuse me, meditate upon those things that are lovely. Pros file, those things that are lovely. This is the only time that is actually used in the New Testament. And the Greek word means that which promotes peace. Meditate upon things that promote peace. Man, too much of my day is spent worrying about things I can't truly control. And instead of taking it to the Lord, I allow my mind to just fester with the what ifs. And the last thing it does is promote peace. It promotes strife within my heart. It promotes a character of somebody I'm dealing with that is not accurate so that when I come to that person, I don't have an accurate understanding of where they're coming from. I just have a thought in my head of what I think they're thinking. And then 10 times out of 10, generally, 
when I go to speak to that person that's on my mind, that wasn't at all what they were thinking. That wasn't at all who they were. They didn't have that thought towards me at all, but what do I do in my mind? I allow those things that don't promote peace, but they promote strife. And I form for myself trouble that isn't even there. Corey Ten Boom had a lot of amazing quotes, things that we ought to listen to and, and it apply in our lives. And she talked about worry and anxiety. And Paul's going to talk a little bit about that as we begin to wrap up. She said, paraphrasing, because I can't remember the exact quote, that the weight of one day is enough. You can't bear the weight of two days, so why worry about that which is out ahead? The weight that you're carrying for the day that is present is enough. How dare you think you could carry two days of a load? Let it go. Let God be at work. The last thing is meditate upon those things that are admirable. Again, euphema, which is the Greek word here that is only used this at this point in Scripture, it's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. And that says meditate upon those things that are positive and those things that are constructive. So, verse 9, which we already read, it talks about the things you learned, received. Paul is saying, I've taught you this. I've been the example. And I've charged you guys with the same charge that, that is for me. Let's be the example. Do you guys find that the people around you, particularly I find with my kids, they magnify, man, they magnify the good, they definitely magnify the bad, right? The little things that are, you know, bothersome, the things that you think, why, why, are, they, why are they acting like this? Well, they're just magnifying dad or mom most of the times. Something that you don't even recognize, and then you see it in them, and you're like, man, that's, that's not okay, well, just, they magnify. They look at you as the example, good or bad, and they magnify. It's, it's been done all throughout history. The sarcasm that is just rampant in my family because of me <laughs> is just magnified in my kids. My kids can just slay me with words, and I think, where did this come from? Oh, that's right. It came from Dad. So I learned through that, you know, after I reprimand them for acting out of line, the Lord reprimands me. Yeah, okay, well, that's you. I want you to stop. I'm using your kids as an example because I don't want you to be sarcastic, right? Ooh, man, it's something that just, they're so good at it. How'd they get so good at it? Hanging out with Dad. <laughs> Paul knew. These who he loved, he loved so dearly. They were going to naturally follow what they saw. And so he's saying, whether it's your mind, I want you to think about these things. If I'm not present, meditate upon these things. Look to God. Look to his example. Remember. From verse 10 to 13 it says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now, at last, your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, you, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to a need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And this is, unfortunately, I believe, a widely abused verse amongst Christianity. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the only thing we pray for is, Lord, give me more prosperity so that I can just conquer, conquer, conquer. But Paul says, I learned the strength of the Lord through having much and then suffering and having nothing. I learned the strength that, that God has given me from him, all things, right, through not prosperity necessarily, but from suffering need and want. I've learned that there is strength that God will bring me through, that I can do all things, not from the prosperity message, but from the difficulties and the trials, so, godly strength is, is learning something. It's learning that riches don't satisfy. And in the next moment, learning that when we have nothing, that we're not going to be left alone, that he's going to provide. It's learning to trust him when you don't have anything but him as a resource. 
He's found contentment in humility. And, and this is the root of what he's saying. I, I found contentment in humility. And I'm humble in prosperity. Trusting that my God shall supply all my needs. He's going to go on to say, according to his riches in glory, he's, he's saying the Lord's going to supply all your needs. But he's definitely saying here in this part of it that the Lord has supplied all my needs according to his riches and his glory. Whatever state I'm in, I'm content. That's the, tr- the true heart of a believer. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. That's Acts 16 it's recorded. And then verse 16 here, for even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. In Acts 17 that's recorded. And not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. I was talking to the worship team today, and I reminded them, you know, uh, during prayer, you know, allow the congregation to remember to give of their first fruits. Not because the doors are going to close and the light bill isn't going to be paid, but because ultimately it means blessings to to be added to your account, faithfulness to say, Lord, in my prosperity and in my struggle, you have told me that I ought to give of my first fruits. So I'm going to be filled with faith and do that very thing. I'm going to give of my resources, and you're going to use it to further your kingdom in this area and use it how you see fit. There is a great act of faith that takes place in doing that. And the Lord blesses. And the Lord adds to the account. And this is really what Paul is saying here. Now, there's my televangelist. We need your money. Oh, gosh, no. This is about the, the, the greatest degree that you would see it. And it's rooted in this right here. I don't seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Right? Nothing changes here. You're not ever going to hear that from the pulpit with a heart of, wow, we could do so much more. We could just get into people's pockets. Paul is saying, I want to see the fruit that abounds to your account. I want to see that. Paul wanted them to give because he knew God would bless. I'm so blessed to see right, that your account is filled by God because of your generosity, he's saying. He's, fat. He's saying here, I'm, I'm actually full. I don't have any need. I just love that you're willing to give and to bless because ultimately I know that God's going to bless you and I love you. That's a, that's a sincere heart right there. I can get behind that. So now it says, as we begin to close, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So let's read to the end of the chapter, and we'll close. And... uh, I just I have one more point I want to share. It says, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Did you hear that? Those that are of Caesar's household? So what's happening here? Well, this really is a bookend to what happened or what he wrote in chapter 1, verse 12. If you don't remember that, turn there. I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So what is he saying? As a result of the imprisonment, Corey Ten Boom, as a result of that imprisonment, Justin Martyr, as a result of my imprisonment, Ravenhill, All of these that have spoke up and said, this is what true Christianity is. I've counted the cost. I know it's not about a prosperity message, but it's about winning 
people to the kingdom that we have been invited to partake of that nobody can take away. The sincerity you hear there, as he says back in chapter 1, verse 12, the things that have happened to me, and you guys know what happened to him. They've actually done something positive. They've furthered the gospel, and then here he is closing with this letter saying, the people of Caesar's household. So, those what? Those that were part of his house arrest? Those that were part of his imprisonment? Those soldiers assigned to keep an eye on him? Maybe even those loyalists that were there for, for Caesar. Maybe it was those that were in complete opposition that just couldn't wait to see Paul get his. But they had to spend time as their occupation around this man, protecting or keeping him from breaking free as if he truly would. And what happened? That inward joy come out in all of these godly ways. Gentleness. Boldness of the Holy Spirit. To stand firm, to stand up. Especially in difficult situations. And to, to truly know that all of it, believer, works out for the furtherance of the gospel if we're willing. Amen? All right, well, let's pray and uh, stick around in fellowship. And uh, I would just would encourage you again uh, to let each other know today that you care about each other. Don't let anything fester. Don't, don't let your mind go to places where you think that people are saying things or are discontent or, or are just unhappy with you go and talk and and remember and rejoice that you're in the book of life look beyond this minute time in eternity and let people know do it today be bold this is difficult this is even more difficult sometimes than talking to non-believers is to humble yourself and actually go up to somebody and let them know remind them that you love them Remind them that you care for them. Remind them that you're praying for them. And watch what it does to the body. It will strengthen. It will magnify Christ. It'll do what Paul says is the foundational walk of a Christian and the attributes of Christ seen from within us. All right, let's pray. Lord, bless and cover our time as we go from here. Help us to have a boldness, Lord, but ultimately, Lord, if, if is anybody struggling today, let them just be reassured of your love for them and the love of the body for them and towards them. We praise you. We love you. We ask you to bring us back here safely again Wednesday and Sunday. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church.